Well, good morning. What a great weekend, huh? Fantastic. Well, um, I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Um, the outside is beautiful, but what is happening inside today, it's a baptism Sunday this morning, and what's happening inside is every bit as beautiful as outside. And so I'm so glad that you've joined us here today. My name is Eric Umdahl. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Calvary Bible Church. Our senior pastor, Danny, is officiating the baptisms uh, this morning. And uh, so I'm filling in preaching because uh, he's taken some uh, remedial swimming lessons just to make sure that everything goes okay. <laughs> You know, we don't want any accidents, so uh, he'll be ready to go uh, once the baptisms come. So, well, I'm excited to be here today. You know, when something is handcrafted, it gives it a little bit of extra value. And when something is handmade personally and specifically for someone that is known and loved by the craftsman, then that thing can become priceless. I brought along something with me today. It's a wooden stool that my dad made. He made it for my boys to be able to step up and reach the bathroom sink. <clears throat> it actually came from an oak tree that grew on his property. My brothers and I cut it down one Thanksgiving, kind of a fun, you know, guy activity to do together. And, uh, and he made it, and it's beautiful, it's functional, but even more than that, it means something because it was made by my dad, uh, and it represents a relationship. He carefully formed it. He, he crafted it. He gave attention to detail. He even told me he selected this piece of wood with a, a knot and a nice grain pattern because he knew I would appreciate the character of the stool. And it's true. I do. I, and so I, I really enjoy and value this stool because of the relationship that it represents. So much more than if I were to use a similar stool that could serve the same function, this one carries a relationship because it was personally formed. And the same thing is true when we think about how God made people. He formed us personally. And we see that right from the beginning, the account of the creation of Adam. For the past few months, we've been talking about God's creative work in its majesty and magnificence. In Genesis 1, we see how God created an amazing world with beauty, complexity, diversity, minute in detail, but expansive with space and seas stretching on farther than the, the best telescope can see. But in Genesis 2, the focus shifts. Like the stool that was handcrafted by my dad with love, the climax of God's creative work was of the highest value and was motivated by love and a commitment to relationship. Today we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. I encourage you to turn there. And we'll see how God's personal creation of people infuses us with value and reveals God's desire for a personal relationship with those he created in his image. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2. I'll begin reading in verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens... When no bush of the field was yet in the land, no small plant of the field had sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. And there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature." This passage begins with sort of an odd phrase. It says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. Now, we would expect that sort of thing at the beginning of a genealogy, right? You know, it seems strange, though, to talk about the generations of the heavens and the earth. Well, what we have here is a key phrase. <clears throat> In fact, this, this exact formula uh, continues ten times, or it, it's repeated ten times throughout the book of Genesis, and it's called the Toledot Formula. Because toledot is the word that's translated generations. And each time it appears, it indicates the beginning of a new section in the text, in the narrative of Genesis. So, for instance, uh, Genesis 6-9 says, These are the generations of Noah. Genesis 37-2 says, These are the generations of Jacob. And in each case, the focus uh, that, of the text that follows is primarily on 
the descendants of the one that was named. So, for instance, uh, the generations of Jacob means that the next section will focus on Joseph and the other sons of Jacob. In other words, the generations that come from Jacob. And so, it makes a little bit more sense. The generations of the heavens and the earth means that the next section of Genesis will focus on the generations that come from God's creation of the heavens and the earth, which, of course, is the very first people, Adam and Eve, whom God made from the dust of the earth. By the way, this is the first statement of many in this passage that make it clear that the theory of evolution is not compatible with the biblical account of creation because it states very clearly that uh, humans... The first humans came not from another animal. They did not come from some sort of missing link, but that God formed the first man from the dust of the earth and breathed life into him. It also seems to suggest, although it doesn't state it explicitly, that the creation of man came soon after God created all the rest of the heavens and the earth. Well, the next couple of verses describe what the earth was like when God created Adam. Now, if you were paying careful attention when we went through Genesis chapter 1, this section might raise a few questions in your mind. You might say, now, wait a minute. In Genesis 1, it says that plants were created on day 3 and people were created on day 6. But here, it seems to be saying that there were no plants when God created Adam. What's, what's happening here? Well, the biblical author is giving us some background information to the main event that's coming in verse 7, the creation of man. And there are a couple of possible explanations of What's going on here? The first uh, explanation is that chapter 2 is just really not concerned with the order of events. Uh, It's just summarizing God's creative work when he made the whole world. And the focus is on the climactic event of the creation of man. So the focus, you know, isn't on the order. And that's that's certainly true. Uh, Genesis 1 is much more focused on the order of things than Genesis 2. But that's not really a, sati- a completely satisfying answer, uh, and I think there's something more that's going on here. I think what God is doing is setting the stage for the job that he has lined up for the man to do. He's showing us why the man was needed on the earth. Here's what I mean. Understanding a little bit about the Hebrew words used for plant uh, that are used in this passage is helpful. The first uh, phrase says, when no bush of the field was yet in the land. The Hebrew word that's translated bush of the field here is a different word than used in Genesis 1, and it seems to be referring to scrubby, thorny type plants. And some scholars feel that this points ahead to Genesis 3.18, after the fall, when God says that thorns and thistles will make growing crops difficult. In other words, this word refers to weeds. It is saying that before man was created, before sin entered the world, there were no weeds in the fields. The second reference to plants uses a different uh, Hebrew word for plants. It says, no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. That phrase seems to be referring to the absence of cultivated crops. In other words, before God created man, there was no agriculture because there was no one there to plant, cultivate, irrigate, and harvest those crops. And he's saying that, uh, that um, in fact, we see that in verse 5, it, where it says, the end of verse 5, later it's the same verse, but just a, a few phrases later, it says, there is no man to work the ground. So, I think what God is doing here is saying, I've created this amazing world, and all these amazing plants, but I don't have anyone to cultivate it, and make fruitful this world that I've created. So I'm going to make a man. And I'm going to give him the responsibility to tend the garden on my behalf. I'm going to make, I'm going to have him make things fruitful and multiply them by domesticating these plants that I've created. So verses 5 and 6 are not there to tell us the order of creation. That's what Genesis 1 does. Rather, these verses set the stage for creation. Uh, the creation of man, by telling us what wasn't there. There were no weeds, which came after the fall, and cultivated crops, because there was no one there yet to cultivate them. And so, God shows us the need for mankind on the earth to keep the garden, to cultivate crops, and make fruitful the world that God has created. And so now, 
we get to the climactic event, the climax of God's creation. Everything else up to this point has been pointing forward, background information uh, for the next section, the main event, the creation of man. So let's look again at verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. Now, there's one thing I want us to notice right from the get-go here. And it's that God has chosen a very specific name for himself in this passage. As God describes the creation of people, he very purposefully chooses to use his double name, Yahweh Elohim, translated Lord God which emphasizes both his creative power and his desire for relationship with his people. And this is a change from chapter 1. <clears throat> Throughout Genesis 1, the name used for God is Elohim. It's the more generic term for God. It talks about his creative power, his majesty as God, and it's a very fitting title for the creator of the universe. God, powerful God, Elohim. But starting here in chapter 2, we see a, a change, or really, it's an addition. For the first time, God's personal name, Yahweh, is used. In fact, both names are used together. Yahweh Elohim, Lord God. Yahweh is God's covenant name. And it emphasizes God's desire to have a relationship with his people. The combination of these two names is really unique. In fact, it appears in this section, Genesis 2 and 3, but only once in the entire rest of the Old Testament. It's very fitting that both of these names are used here because in this account of God creating mankind, because on one hand, this is the mighty, powerful creator God Elohim, completing the finest of his creative work. And at the same time, this is the personal God, Yahweh, who desires to have a relationship of loving kindness with his people that he is creating. We see this relational emphasis not only in the name that was chosen, but really in the tone <clears throat> of this whole section. <clears throat> in contrast to Genesis 1, the account of the creation of man is very personal and intimate. Genesis 1 is orderly and systematic. God's power is on display as he calls things into existence by his spoken word. But here in chapter 2, his creation of people is more hands-on. It's personal. Verse 7 says that he formed the man of dust from the ground. That word formed is most commonly used for a potter forming clay in his hands. He molds each part just as he wants it to be with the personal touch of his skilled hands. It's really a very intimate picture. And then even more personally, verse 7 says, Yahweh breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now that's personal. There are only a very few people that I let breathe on my face. That face-to-face -face intimate contact. It's, it's the people I love most dearly and have the closest relationships to. With the, while the breath of life, what God formed from the dust, is no longer just physical matter. God has made him a living per person. Life has come directly from God himself. We can make a lot of cool stuff with today's technology, but even our greatest scientists cannot create life from something that does not already have the seed of life in it. The expression breath of life is also very significant. In fact, it's only used in scripture of God and of humans, never of animals. There's something very different about God's creation of people. When God breathed into Adam, he made him in the image of God. He gave him sonship. He established him as ruler, as servant ruler over his creation. He gave him the capacity for spiritual understanding and spiritual relationship. He made him a moral being. God had already created a world abundant with life, beauty, and creative wonder. Animals and plants of all varieties, beautiful mountain vistas, seas and space that stretched on and on. Creation already was a masterpiece. But in this intimate act of creation, God formed the first man personally and specially, placing on humanity the highest value among all his amazing creation. And he did it with dirt. It's interesting that God starts with dust. 
Working with the dust that he already created, he forms his highest creation. In fact, there's a word play that's going on here in Hebrew that we don't uh, readily see in the English translation. The word dust is very similar to the word for man. And so in English, it might be something like, from the earth, he made an earthling. There's a connection that's there. And it demonstrates that from the very beginning, there's a bond that we have with the earth. From dust we come, and to dust we shall return. God created us to be spiritual beings like him, but we are also inseparably physical in this life. God made us from the earth, and now I'm tied to this physical body in a way that's very different from God. My sense of well-being is very connected to the condition of this body. I did some projects yesterday, and now my body's telling me, you did some projects yesterday. We're both physical and spiritual beings. Our job is to tend the earth. From from our creation, we have a strong connection to this planet, and it speaks to our role in God's creation. As we saw in Genesis 1.28, and we'll see again in verse 15, 2.15, that our role is to care for the earth, to have dominion over it, to make it abundant and fruitful. God formed us from the earth and has given us the responsibility to care for and make fruitful his creation. So what does all of this mean? Well, there are some key observations that I think we can make from this text. I'd like to mention three ideas that I think God wants us to see in this passage about his creation of man. The first one is that God made us. Life comes from God alone. We did not evolve. We're not the result of some random chance. God made us, and because he made us, he has authority over us, and we have a responsibility to him. If I were to take my family to the beach for a beach day, I might decide to build a a sandcastle. If I want to make it big, I can make it big. If I want to smash it down, I can smash it down because it's my sandcastle. If I want to make some rules that, hey, in the kingdom of Eric Sandland, everyone has to wear bare feet and you have to say the secret password starfish in order to cross the moat into my kingdom. I can do that because it's my sandcastle. And in a similar way, God created this world. It's his. He has authority over it. He has authority over us, and we have a responsibility to him whether we acknowledge it or not. The second thing for us to remember, not only did God make us, but God made us both physical beings and spiritual beings. Both of these are true. God created us physical like the earth, but we are also spiritual beings like God. As physical beings, God has given us the task of caring for and making fruitful the world that he created it. We manage and rule it in his place, and he's glorified when we do that. But we are also spiritual beings. God made us different from the rest of us creation. And if we focus just on the physical life, we miss the point. And that's why the third observation is so important. That God made us personally and specially. We were created for relationship with God. The mighty creator God Elohim came down personally to form Adam from the dust and intimately breathed the breath of life from his nostrils. Yahweh created humanity with love and he has placed on us great value as ones created in his image and entrusted with his purpose. Most of all, he invites us into relationship with him. A relationship that reflects the loving community that we see in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So how do we respond to this? There are many ways that this passage comes to bear on our lives, but let me suggest two ways that we can apply this passage today. First of all, we must remember that people have great value. And so we are to treat all people as highly valuable Because they are God's special creation. There may be people at your workplace and family that are difficult to love. They are created in God's image. There may be people we're tempted to look down on because of choices that they've made, sins they're struggling with, or maybe ways that they're different from us. 
they too are created in God's image and have ultimate value. This is why we as Christians value the baby in the womb as well as the mother that carries the baby. This truth also means seeing yourself with value and purpose that comes from God. It's possible that you're here today and you're struggling with feeling worthless, with feeling unlovable, wondering if you have value. God created you in his image. He loves you intimately. You have value not because of what you've done or haven't done, but because you were made in God's image. You have immense value as God's creation and are deeply loved by him. When I have something particularly valuable, like a new camera or a nice car, I take good care of it because it has great value to me. And this passage reminds us that all people are created with great value because they are made in the image of God. They are created specially by God. And so we ought to treat them with high value. The second way that I hope we'll respond to this truth is to remember that we were created for relationship with God and that we are to use the experiences of this physical life to cultivate a spiritual relationship with God. The intimacy of this account makes it clear that God designed us for relationship with him. He placed us here in this physical world so that through the experiences of our physical lives, we might cultivate a growing spiritual relationship with him. The relationship that Adam and Eve enjoyed in the garden with with God was broken by sin. But because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to live again each day in relationship with God. And all of our experiences in this physical life can be catalysts for spiritual growth. If we seek Christ through them, our celebrations and hardships, our relationships and responsibilities can all help us to know him more personally and provide an opportunity to trust him more completely as we seek him. Watching my children grow, I can see how their experiences form a big part of their learning, their growth and development. And the same thing is true for us spiritually. God often uses our physical experiences to grow us spiritually. I've talked to many people that share that dealing with serious physical illness or injury has played a critical role in bringing them back to God or causing them to draw close to God. For other people, physical experiences like just kind of everyday physical experiences like serving in various types of ministries or going on a retreat or seeing God in creation have played a key role in their spiritual growth. Some of those key moments in my own spiritual life have been on mission trips where we're serving and meeting other people's physical needs or wrestling with physical challenges ourselves. We all have these physical experiences in our lives, both successes and failures, big and small, but the key thing is seeking the Lord through them so that through our physical experiences, we might know and serve him spiritually. Solomon understood this as he reflected on both the good and bad experiences of life. He wisely urged his reader in Ecclesiastes 12.1 to remember your creator in the days of your youth. God uses our physical frailty to draw us into deeper intimacy with him. From the beginning, God created people for relationship with him. He created us both physical and spiritual beings to help us know him better. God's creation of people was personal and purposeful. And the thing that I hope we'll walk away today, the big idea that I want us to remember, is that God handcrafted people, giving them life, value, and purpose so that we might know and serve him. God has handcrafted each person you meet, giving them life, value, and purpose so that we might know and serve him. We can do that by treating all people with great value and cultivating a meaningful relationship with God. Today is a special day. It's Baptism Sunday. We've just spent all this time talking about God's amazing work in creation whereby he has given this personal and powerful gift of human life. But God's amazing creative work does not stop with physical life. God is also in the business of giving spiritual life. 
And that's what we're going to celebrate with the remainder of our service today. With this baptism service, we're going to have the privilege of hearing stories of people who have not only received the gift of physical life, but the gift of spiritual life in Christ. Let's pray. Yahweh Elohim, our creator God, we praise you for being the giver of life. Each of us are here in this world by your pleasure. You have formed each of us specially by your loving hand, and you have invited us to know and serve you. Please help us to value others the way that you value us and to seek you and know you through the experiences of our lives. We praise you that you not only give the blessing of physical life, you also offer to each of us the gift of spiritual life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We celebrate the transforming work that you have done in those coming to be baptized today, and we pray that you would continue your good work that you have begun in them. In Jesus' name we pray.